The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. When we lived in Pennsylvania, my second favorite room in the entire house was the front porch. It was a tiny little thing. They had just like put screen windows on it. It used to be open, and then someone previously decided to make it a three-season porch. So it had this beautiful ledge all the way along, and then these huge windows... And it was just enough that you could put a chair and a footstool. I loved that room. But in the evening, it wasn't as pleasant because we had one of those lights that was like super bright. So if you turned it on, you were like blinded and it wasn't pleasant. So my husband and I decided to go to Lowe's and look at some lighting options. Because of the beautiful ledge that went all the way around, we selected rope lights. You've seen rope lighting before? It's like a big rope of light with these little LEDs that go all the way through the middle of it. It just gives a soft glow, and we thought we'd put it under that ledge, and it would kind of just softly um, light the floor, and it would make it even more pleasant to sit out there, no bugs, on a beautiful summer evening. It was a gift. We couldn't, we couldn't um, wait to make this front porch even more habitable for ourselves. We got the rope lights home, and we thought that all you had to do was plug them in and like hook them up, and that would be it. And we opened the package, and out of that package came a list of rules on how to use these rope lights this long. And every single one of them ended with, if you do not follow this rule to the T, your house will burn down. I had no idea that rope lights were so dangerous. And I read every single one of those rules. And my husband, being the one who mitigates all of those kinds of things, was like, it's going to be fine. We'll put them, we'll install them correctly. You'll still have your beautiful glow. So he installed them. And for the next six years, I never plugged them in. That beautiful gift had become an obligation. That beautiful gift that I was looking forward to so much was now something to be afraid of, something to worry about, something that was just a law. If you understand what I'm talking about with this, a gift that turns into an obligation, 
something that's meant to be wonderful that ends up just causing you stress and anxiety, then you understand the practice of Sabbath in Jesus' day. Sabbath was there from the very beginning, right? In the very first chapter of Genesis into the second chapter, we learn that Jesus or that God created the whole world in six days. And then on the seventh day, God rested. And because on the seventh day, God rested, all humanity who was created in God's image was also to rest on the seventh day. This practice gets magnified in the wilderness when the people are free from slavery but not yet into the promised land. They learn that on the Sabbath they really have to rest and that they are completely dependent on God for everything. God makes manna rain down from the sky six days a week, double on the day before the Sabbath. But then on the Sabbath... No manna. You're supposed to eat leftovers. Not spend the whole day in the kitchen, but spend the time with one another and with God. In Isaiah, we learn that by the time of the exile, the Sabbath had become a time for community, for coming together. Did you hear how many times it said, your own, your own, your own? It says, if you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. Doesn't that sound good, actually? It's not a day for each of us to go into our own corners exhausted and maybe catch up on the laundry. It's a day to come together, a day to be together. A day to sit next to one another and remind each other just how good God is. And just how blessed we are to be God's people. But there is a long time in between Isaiah and the time of Jesus. In some way, over that amount of time, The Sabbath went from a day of rest, from a day of being together, from a day of depending only on God, to a list of rules so long that if you spent the entire day trying to fulfill those rules, you would probably still get it wrong. Kind of no matter what you did. You just couldn't win. So this beautiful gift becomes an obligation. This thing that's supposed to be wonderful becomes only a law, something that people are actually afraid of if they don't do it right. So Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on a Sabbath, and a woman comes and she needs help. For 18 years, she has been bent over and unable to stand up straight. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, you would have known what everybody's toes looked like. But can you imagine the pain, the isolation, the way that she couldn't get where she wanted to go? She shows up because Jesus is there. And Jesus is the one who can do something about it. And so Jesus puts her hands on her and says, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And this woman stands up straight. 
She stands up straight. She's finally able to look into the eyes of those who love her and those whom she loves. She looks straight into the eyes of Jesus, her Lord. And she begins to praise God. That's all she can do. She's been set free. It is the Sabbath day, the day to praise the Lord. And yet, it's against the rules. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus, in healing this woman, has done some work. How dare he? She should come back tomorrow. He'll be here still. He could do it tomorrow. To which Jesus responds, you hypocrites. He reminds them that although there are tons of rules about the Sabbath, all these rules made because somebody broke one one time, you still care for what is yours. You take your donkey, you feed it at the manger, but then you also untie it and bring it to water because it is an animal inside your care. And that animal won't understand if you just leave it in the barn with no food and water for a day every week. Now, you don't put the donkey to the plow. Even the donkey is not supposed to work. But you care for it nonetheless. And Jesus says, this woman, she has suffered for 18 years Day after day after day, she should not have to wait one more day. And in fact, this is exactly what the Sabbath is for. The Sabbath is so that we can be set free. Set free from what ails us. Set free from what keeps us apart from God. Set free from what keeps us apart from one another. Free indeed. And it says that all his opponents were put to shame and everyone spoke well of him. We'll come back next week because that never lasts for long. And here we sit. On a different Sabbath day, we Christians practice Sabbath on Sundays rather than Friday night to Saturday night because Jesus rose on the first day of the week at early dawn on a Sunday morning? How do we practice Sabbath? Just about every one of you who is sitting here today remembers a time when things weren't open on Sundays, right? You all remember a time when people did go to grandma's house for Sunday dinner, when people didn't hook up the plow, or the harvester, or anything else. And maybe there was a pickup game of softball. Where I come from, where where we spent time in Pennsylvania, it was the day to make ice cream from scratch. But this is no longer the world that we live in. You can go anywhere today. You can go and buy your meal. You can go to any kind of sports game that you want to go to. You can buy whatever you want. It's always open. So what is Sabbath for us? From what do you need to be set free? Is it a day of rest? Is it an hour to catch your breath? Is it, as it has been for me with my kids this summer, time to sit around the literal dining room table and play an actual physical board game together? Is it a time to not have to cook for once? Is it a time to lay down your grudges and your grievances and reach out to someone who needs to also be set free? The practice of Sabbath in this time and day is difficult, but it is also still a gift. 
God desires our rest. God desires that we would look to God for everything we need. God desires that we gather together in community. God desires that we stand up straight 